to Hewitt whenever events shake the world. I try and reach out to John Fisher Burns, longtime journalist with the New York Times, winner of two Pulitzer Prizes, formerly the London Bureau Chief, the Baghdad Bureau Chief, the Beijing Bureau Chief, basically the BR Chief of everywhere for the New York Times. John is retired, but not his knowledge. John Fisher Burns joins us from England this morning. How are you, John? Great to have you back on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Well, it's these, we live in worrying times, but it's always cheering to talk to you. Well, thank you. I, I immediately thought of you because of the, your years in Iraq when roadside bombs would go off, shaped as a projectile because of the Quds forces. How did you react to the news of the, the death of Soleimani? Well, I think there's no doubt that uh, he's the most important of the three major uh, leaders, terrorist leaders that have been uh, hit by the United States. I think he's done far more damage cumulatively uh, than after 9-11. Of course, uh, bin Laden in hiding was not able to accomplish much. Baghdadi more, but I think Soleimani has had much more blood on his hands uh, in the last 10 years than either of those two. Now, in terms of his his reach and his strategic objective, how do you rank him as a terrorist leader in terms of, of his strategic grasp of issues? Well, I think there's no doubt that he, he was extraordinarily successful, um, but perhaps that success led him to... to uh, a complacency that put him on that road outside uh, Baghdad Airport the other night. Uh, looking at the map, I realized that, uh, and I don't know how things have changed since I left, which is some years ago now, but the U.S. Uh, military intelligence headquarters in Iraq was only a couple of hundred yards away from where those oh. uh, missiles struck the car. And Baghdad International Airport is controlled and effectively always has been by the United States military. So he obviously felt that he was untouchable uh, in a time of great crisis to drive in a convoy of two vehicles and expose himself as he did. Hubris has killed a lot of people over the century. John Fisher Burns, what do you think they're debating inside the Iranian regime. Number one, Soleimani was the number two guy. So when you have the number two guy removed, you always wonder whether or not someone helped us uh, who whose way was blocked by Soleimani. But number two, Hamani is not young, and he's never been well. They're going to have a succession crisis on their hands now. Well, they are, and I think there are some misconceptions which will be reinforced by the events today in Kerman with the 35 people being trampled to death in a stampede, when we see these uh, photographs, these images from Iran of millions of people taken to the streets, there is a counterpoint to that, which anybody who's visited Iran over the years knows, which is that you go into any bazaar or supermarket, people will approach you soon enough telling you how much they hate the Ayatollahs and how they, uh, they yearn for the United States to connive in ending the regime. It's dangerous to engage with people like that because you never know whether some of them may be plants, but they're, they're there. Um, so there is there is a counterpoint. Uh, there are millions upon millions of I- Iranians uh, who would uh, very much like to be free of the grip of the Ayatollahs. Uh, they, of course, in circumstances like this are invisible and uh, inaudible. Is there um, a... Um a possibility that the re- regime itself is in trouble. Up until the death of Soleimani, they had had to murder 1,000 of their own people in the streets over the last six weeks. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's a fragile, it's a very fragile regime. And um, the end of it is, 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 is foretold that the Ayatollahs will eventually be toppled. How? It'll, it'll be domestic by domestic uh, resistance. But I think when the end comes, it may come as quickly as the, the Shah's end came, uh, because there is that deep unpopularity. There are divisions even uh, within the government and the, and the clerical administration of, of uh, Iran. Um, now, uh, John, when how, you were in Baghdad, and we would talk by phone when you were covering the New York Times from there, and you were heavily protected, but it was nevertheless very, very dangerous, very wearying. You got to know the various factions very well. And as you watch Iran uh, uh, 
furious. We also see in Iraq those divisions reopening. Do you think we're on the brink of the bad years of 06, 07 again? I think we're in a very complicated situation there. And it, uh, I would like to have it explained to me what our objectives are. Uh, the events of the last 24 hours um, have a very awkward sense of apotheosis. It reminded me a little bit uh, in this uh, letter that was delivered to the Iraqi prime minister, which appeared to, uh, to anticipate an American withdrawal, as we know now. Uh, it was, was much more limited than that. It was a withdrawal, a considerable withdrawal from the American embassy in the center of Baghdad. But I had the feeling a little bit that we was, it was Saigon 1975 all over again. Uh, Americans fleeing the capital in helicopters. Um, uh, you know, how, is this what it's come to in the end, that the most that American troops can do in Iraq is to engage in protecting themselves? Um, it's a, it would be a tragic end to what has been um, a very vexed enterprise ever since uh, the invasion of 2003. Now, of course, you know General Petraeus well. He was interviewed by Foreign Policy, and he said, do not underestimate the significance of this. It is far more significant than the killing of Osama or al-Baghdadi. Points you made, John Burns. Soleimani was the architect and operational commander of their expeditionary forces, and he believes, in fact, it may bring some resolution to Iraq. And put the Iranian uh, proxies back in a box. Do you share that optimism? Well, if there's anybody whose judgment on this, uh, I would trust it would be uh, David Petraeus. I, on more than one occasion, accompanied him uh, on his helicopter to the, Iran to the Iranian border with Iraq when uh, the uh, Soleimani and the Quds Force were busy... Uh, um, smuggling uh, explosively formed projectiles into Iraq, very often in shipments of, of bricks. And we went to a brick kiln, which was known to be a transit point for these weapons. So um, we're talking now about 2006, 2007. Uh, there's no doubt that Soleimani killed a lot of Americans. Um, and uh, sooner or later, an American president was going to take act, direct action against him. As a matter of fact, the British had him in their crosshairs when uh, they were, uh, British military were in Basra uh, a little bit earlier than that. And at that time, the British Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, now living in New York, uh, um, uh, intervened at that time to dissuade, to order the British SAS not to attack money, but his days were numbered, um, and it's, if, if there's any real surprise about this, is it's taken as long as it has. What Petraeus said that I, I specifically want the audience to hear is, yes, Iran can respond, they can retaliate, and that can lead to further retaliation. That is clear now that this administration, the Trump administration, is willing to take very substantial action. This is a pretty clarifying moment in that regard. So deterrence is on the table. I think that's what Trump is attempting to reestablish. Do you think it'll work, John Burns? I think we, we won't be able to answer that question for some time. But my guess is that this has weakened the Iranian regime considerably, at least in the short term. It doesn't appear to be anybody of similar stature to step up and take over Soleimani's position. As I've said, the Iranian uh, a the theocracy was already deeply fractured and deeply fragile. Um, so there, there may be an upside to this, but in the short term, I think, uh, and I'm sure General Petraeus would agree with this, uh, we've got to brace ourselves because there will be some kind of reaction. And it could be, by the way, in my own country here in the United Kingdom, uh, known to the uh, Ayatollahs as the little Satan uh, in the lee of the big Satan in the United States, uh, it's long been known that there are Iranian sleeper cells here and in France, elsewhere in Europe as well. And I think that uh, uh, Britain might be more vulnerable in the short term in this, even than the United States is.
Now, I want to close, John, by asking you about your new government, that extraordinary election, the rise of Dominic Cummings. I wrote a piece in the Post about Dominic Cummings this weekend in his Post-it note on, on turning government upside down. How astonished are you at the direction your country has taken in the three years since you've retired from day-to-day journalism? Well, I have to say, and with many millions in this country, I was uh, a little alarmed in the election campaign at the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn uh, in Downing Street. I think now that the media here and the world media misjudged seriously because uh, the sense in the streets throughout the election campaign was uh, that Corbyn couldn't win, uh, that his uh, Manichaean view of uh, life uh, good versus bad, nothing much in between, uh, was not was never going to sell to the British public. So I think there's a good, great deal of relief now that we have a government with a stable majority. Uh, but it too is in a fragile position because um, its its victory was secured by getting a majority of the working class vote in this country. That's an extraordinary thing. The Conservative yes. Party took 48 percent of the working class vote. And Johnson is going to have to reform the Conservative Party considerably in order to make sure that those votes which were lent to him, as he said, uh, do not retreat. Uh, So he's got five years and he's got a big, big job in front of him uh, because this country is a divided country, particularly divided on a north-south basis. And the votes that put him back into Downing Street came from the north. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, up there. Now, last question, John Burns. What do you make of Cummings? Uh, it's very hard to work out. He's, you know, I don't think we've seen his like before, not here in any event. Um, he's an unusual character. Uh, but I think if I was a senior member of the, of the civil service of the public service in this country, I'd be a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> if he if he has Johnson's ear on this, and I think he does, uh, we're going to see some pretty extraordinary uh, reforms. I hope you uh, I hope you will essay on that repeatedly as a, as a return to the list, just to keep us posted on what's going on in your home country. John Fisher Burns, always a pleasure to talk with someone who's been everywhere and knows everyone and has a perspective that very few people do. Follow him on Twitter; he's still active there at John Fisher Burns, and I hope he'll be in the New York Times shortly.